Paul wrote to people who wanted more, but they weren't sure how to get it. They truly hungered to grow in their understanding of this new faith in Jesus that they had received. They desired to go to the, the very depths of the relationship and intimacy with God. But they weren't quite sure how to do that. Because what they were doing wasn't working. Oh, they knew how their relationship had begun. It had begun in this wonderful moment of receiving God's grace and the forgiveness of their sins, different for each person and yet for each the same gift. But that's how it had begun. Now, how do you move on and grow? They just weren't sure. And in their defense, that's kind of how we all start, and many of us stay. I know when, when in my own life, Jesus became very important, and, and I so desired to grow in my intimacy and knowledge and, and love for Him, I thought, well, how do you do that? And, and so, I, knowing nothing else, I, I just started reading the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and as I read there in the scriptures, I came across these words of Jesus. And he said, well, if you love me, keep my commands. And I thought to myself, well, I love you. I love you a lot, Jesus. So yes, I, I will keep your commands. And so that, that set in motion a very powerful way of living in my life where I, I truly tried to put everything Jesus said into practice in my life. And he said, love your neighbor. Well, that's easy. I got a lot of good neighbors. Love your enemies. Ah, uh, okay. And, and then there's all the knots and, you know, like, don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat. You know, no lust, no greed. And but it wasn't just the knots and the don'ts. I wanted to grow in, in faithfulness and goodness and usefulness to God and in mercy and sacrifice and service. And, and so all those things just started piling up. And, and when I failed, there was this, this terrible price to pay of guilt and shame. And then in that frustration of realizing, wow, this is really hard. And, and I realized that after all that hard work and after all that time, I hadn't grown a bit. I was still doing the same exact sins that I always did. And all well, the temptations that always were bothering me, they're still bothering me. And so I stayed there for a really long time. Until I learned a little secret. Don't worry, I'm going to share it with you. I learned a little secret that just brought everything together. And it, it helped me to live a life in which I didn't have to deal with all that guilt. And, and, and then I could have a real sense of accomplishment. Yes, I'm starting to get this down and have some real growth. It's a little something I, I, I didn't make it up, but it's, it's available to everyone. It's called selective awareness. I know, you, you sound like you've tried it too. So you just, you don't think about all the negative, nasty things that you do. You just focus in on the good stuff, right? You know, all the, all the little dialogues that go on and, and all the things you actually do and say, you, you just focus on the good. Yeah. And, and that worked out pretty well as I ignored all the bad and, and, and ah, but... The problem is, I really did want a very close and intimate relationship with Jesus. And, and the more time you actually spend in the pages of Scripture listening to Him, the more of your life that is led by the Holy Spirit through those words, the, the, the harder it is because you become more and more aware of yourself. And you really can't live the lie to yourself. And so I found that I was right back where I started from. It was like Groundhog Day, just right back there trying to manage my life in all the words and deeds and actions and the good and the bad. And, and I was stuck. 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 And it wasn't just me. 
I mean, it's lots of people too. I mean, even from those that were mentioned in, in Paul's letter to Rome, to right up here to Ascension Lutheran, who's sitting in this, you know, sanctuary right here. And, and that's, this is where Paul, he begins at this very point in chapter 6 to take up this issue and he diagnoses the issue, he diagnoses the real problem, and then he gives the real path forward. He says, you know what, shall we just go on sinning, you know? That grace may increase, that's a, that's a growth plan. By no means. Well then what? What? The, the stuck have this issue. And it's how you look at sin. If you think that sin is simply the bad things that you do and that you need to try and not do them and that you need to, to listen to all of God's rules and then do them, if, if you think then that's, that's all that it really is, the moving forward, you will remain stuck because you fail to realize the power of sin. See, sin isn't just that, oops, I broke one of God's rules, he has rules, and now he's mad, I need to make it up to him. Oh no. Paul makes it very clear that sin has a power, and it is so powerful, it is like a slave master, and you are the slave. Now don't think that every sin, of course, has that kind of power over you, and not every temptation. You're able to fend off a lot of stuff, but something owns you that you must obey it. You know, that's, that's the reason that there are those times that you, you really regret what you did. And so does your spouse and your employer and your teachers. You know, as, when you realize, oh man, I don't know why I drank that much. I, I, I don't want to do that. But you see, every addictive behavior has at its root and its bottom, there's something there. And it's powerful. It's like, wow, I don't know why I just yelled at my kids. But they get me so mad. Where is that coming from? The reason that you use selective awareness so handily is that something owns you. Well, how could something be that powerful and I not know it? You know, how, how could it be, I could be so clueless as to, a, I'm a slave to a slave owner. And, and really, there's only one way to, to really get at it. And that's to look at your, your fears, your demands, and your nightmares. What is it that you know that you could not live without? That you wouldn't just, if you lost it, you wouldn't just be sad and you'd grieve like a normal person would grieve, but you'd be desperate. And you would fight to the death to get it back. And that if you weren't able to, you would just be despondent, you'd maybe even kill yourself. I mean, it's, it's that important. I, I gotta have that. And as you look at that list, you look for what, what, what where are my biggest fears of losing? What do I have? To, what are my demands? What are my nightmares? And you realize that list is made up. Wait a minute. It's, it's not made up of monsters or bad things. It's made up of good things. Like my job. Like I get all of my affirmation and if I don't have my job, then what, I, what am I? Or maybe you have that, that spouse that you, just, you guys have the best relationship but it's not just a great relationship. It's like, it's how I am validated as a human being that I have this person who loves me. Or maybe it's your kids. You know, I, I don't do a lot of things at work and I don't do a lot of things in the community, but you know what? At least I have great kids. And, and, if they, and then I helicopter around them and then I, I go to battle for them and then I, I make life really bad for teachers, you know, but I'm doing that because my kids. See, it's a list of very good things. But when you have to have them, it owns you. And you're a slave. But don't, don't get too anxious. Because absolutely every human being is owned by something or someone. Nobody gets out of this. Ever, you are owned by something or someone. 
That's the reason when you turn on the news, it's so awful all the time. That's the reason it's so hard to be married. That's the reason your kids drive you nuts. That's the reason the people at work drive you crazy. Everybody's owned by something and they have to obey. See, Paul diagnoses that sin isn't just simply breaking a rule, but it is a slavery. And then he gives us the way out. And the way out, he says, or don't you know, and maybe you didn't, don't you know that all of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus, you were buried with him into his death by, in your baptism. And since you were buried with him into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Your old life, with its slavery, was crucified with Jesus. Your new life was given to you at the resurrection and, and by the resurrection of Jesus. And now, this isn't just pretty poetry. This is reality. It is as sure as your own baptism and the resurrection of Jesus. But you have to hear, well, exactly what does this mean, this new life in Jesus? Because it's, it's, it's amazing. And that now in this new life, you see, it, it's not that you won't face temptations. You're still going to face them. It's not that you won't sin. That's not what Paul means when he says you're, you're dead to sin. How can you live in it any longer? It just, it's not your master anymore. See, you have a new master. See, everybody on this earth has a master. But when Jesus is your master, life gets a whole lot better and different. Because he's good. He desires the best for you. He is the one in whom the Father delights. He is the one who will not be discouraged until he brings justice and righteousness to the earth. And your, your life is now in him in, in such a way that you are growing in reliance and faith in him. And this is where the change and the growth in your life can come about. Because Jesus, he loves your neighbor. He loves your enemies. He is good and kind and truthful and faithful. He's everything that the law of God commands that you and I to be and continue to do. He is. And now, your life is in him. So that you can consider yourself, count yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And it is here that, that this new and true life is given to you in such a way that well, you grow and you grow and you become more and more like him as he lives in and through you. So think about what that means. You've been set free from this, this awful burden of managing your life so that you always do the right thing and avoid the wrong thing. And then all the guilt and the shame that comes with that, you've been set free from that. As Jesus invites you, well, just come live with me because I am all of those things. And I'm going to live th through you. And, and you don't need selective awareness anymore because now Jesus knows you through and through and it's, it's okay to be completely <laughs> known because for him to know you, he doesn't look at you and squint and go, when are you going to get it together? He looks at you with the Father's love. See, his love isn't dependent upon your performance or your obedience he simply loves you because he loves you. You think, well, whoever, who does that? Every parent who holds a baby in their arms, you just love the baby, right? Because you'll, you, it's your kid. You, you love your baby. And any, any parent who starts loving their kid because of their performance or obedience, that's where the dysfunction in a family starts coming from. Just to love a kid because they're, they're yours. That's how Jesus loves and knows you. Paul, Paul 
He shows us Jesus. He shows us what sin really is. He shows us what our new life is in baptism. So what do you, what do, you do with this now in this coming week? When you get up in the morning, you make the sign of the cross upon your forehead and your heart. And you begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, reminding you, yourself, that you have been baptized, that you died with Jesus. The old self is gone and the new is here in its reality. And then in whatever way you pray it, Jesus, keep me close to you. And in that prayer, and in your scripture reading, and in your service, it's all done to the glory of God the Father as he keeps you close in this new life. Amen.